All right, thank you. Uh, general colleagues, um, I'm going to talk about uh, <laughs> something I know very little about. <laughs> I did see one once. There we go. Yeah, thanks. Okay, I'm going to talk about uh, beyond the 1% rule, aeromedical risk matrices. So just to start off, I thought I'd give the, uh, the Canadian presentation today uh, and to reinforce stereotypes. Uh, I did notice as soon as, a, as soon as the first few snowflakes fell yesterday and it dipped below zero, everyone was stocking up on non-perishable food items and, and generators and all the shops shut down early, so just saying. Okay, so here's the uh, question. Which of the following is not an advantage of aeromedical risk matrices? I'll let you read through those yourself. Absolutely, okay, well, we'll see how we end up then. So uh, here's the objectives. Uh, basically, I'm going to talk about where we're, we're coming from, at least in the RCAF, in, in terms of the 1% rule, and really focus on the, uh, the limitations uh, and, and where the rule came from uh, to understand how to best use it, and then where we're going with uh, risk matrices for air medical disposition dis, uh, decision aids. Uh, we'll examine the benefits of considering the probability stratified across consequence severity, and illustrate a case example. And I do want to say that the, um, uh, just going to back up here, I just want to say that uh, really uh, Dr. Gary Gray at CFME in Toronto, it, he's the one who came up with this whole notion of using uh, uh, risk matrices for air medical dispositions and so he gets to get full credit for all the stuff you like about this and anything you don't like that didn't represent well, you can blame it on me. So let's go back to the 1% rule. Uh, when, when you look at uh, the various references, it's risk of medical in-flight incapacitation in pilots that should be no greater than 1% per annum, and that's for two pilot civil aviation commercial operations. So that's how the rule uh, is intended to be interpreted. Now, if you look at the origins of the rule, uh, the, the biggest point of this slide is it all started with a Canadian, so you know it's a good rule. Uh, and it uh, had to do with uh, Ian Anderson's, um, his, his experience both as a senior flight surgeon and uh, his, his work in the uh, Air Medical Authority or their worthiness world uh, where he noted that for air worthiness back in the 70s, uh, all the non-human systems uh, required that the, uh, a catastrophic loss of aircraft or life should be no more than one in 10 million hours. So he postulated that pilot failure could be really looked at in the same way as other non-pilot systems and you could have the same benchmark. And so this is really the first uh, attempt to have an objective uh, benchmark for, for pilot incapacitation. Uh, and then this, uh, this principle was uh, moved forward by the British uh, uh, in the early 80s through a series of workshops uh, where they, the idea was really advanced and, and developed. So. What exactly is the 1% rule? Well, essentially you're lining the risk of accidents, so that's your outcome, due to pilot incapacitation, not accidents to other types of human factors that can uh, affect safety, uh, with, within the risk tolerances accepted for uh, engineering systems failure. Now, they went from the one in 10 million to one in a billion flying hours, uh, based on the fact that the human system can only account for 
or actually no one system could account for more than 10% of the whole uh, system or system of systems and that within that most of those human failures would be human factors and not medical incapacitation so therefore they said the benchmark should be one in a billion flying hours. Uh, so you do some math and you work that back to 1% per year for an incapacitating medical event and this is used uh, widely by air medical authorities around the world. Uh, the, the validity has been questioned uh, uh, for many quarters and uh, this is really assumes a catastrophic uh, outcome. So specifically the assumptions are uh, two pilot operations, that's very important, and it, b basically by having two pilots it's assumed that for every 100 incapacitations, uh, 99 times out of 100 the co-pilot will save the day. Uh, another assumption is that, and this is back in the 70s, average uh, commercial flight time was uh, just over an hour, so really you're worried about the, the ends, the takeoff and landings, and that's really only six minutes altogether per that hour of flight, which is uh, uh, safety critical where the incapacitation would then lead to uh, a smoke and hole. So if you uh, work backwards and you say, okay, how many hours in a year, basically you have uh, 10,000 hours and then if you're saying that you have two decimal places protecting you from the co-pilot, one more for the 10% critical phases of flight, you add those together and, and the risk is 1% uh, uh, per year translates to the, uh, the risk of uh, one in a million capacitations and, and one in a billion overall uh, for the hours. So for the RCAF uh, some of these assumptions inherent within the 1% rule do not apply to our military air operations. Uh, does that apply to single seat ejection seat fighter? Uh, is there really only uh, two critical uh, phases pulling six minutes per hour of flight? Uh, probably not. The consequences of medical events are likely to vary considerably depending on what's crew, what is the position of the air crew. Is it, are they a pilot? Are they a LODI, are they an FE, and are the consequences likely to be the same? Well, no. Uh, and uh, what type of mission? Is it uh, strategic airlift? Is it uh, tactical? Uh, is it uh, um, you know, fighter ops? These are all gonna have a, a difference in terms of the likely consequences given uh, a medical event. And uh, all of us have our, our various uh, uh, air medical uh, uh, worthiness types of uh, systems and ours we address uh, restrictions and, and groundings through our air factors. So the evolution, where are we going? The matrix. You've seen matrix, matrices before and we had a, a great talk, uh, a couple of great talks which I mentioned them. Um, it's an evidence-based tool and it integrates both the predicted probability of a medical event and the potential impact. Uh, we heard at the beginning of this afternoon that if you have a tiger, it's not just the probability that there's a tiger, it's about what's the context. Is the tiger behind a cage or are you be stuck behind a cage with the tiger? So another way of saying that is it's the probability times the, the consequence of that context. So the major C will uh, enable risk stratification across consequence categories, which you assign in the matrix. Uh, the, the thresholds can be customized for the operational context, for different aircrew occupations, for different types of missions with different inherent levels of uh, risk. And it reduces the natural bias towards, you know, what's the worst case scenario, which everyone uh, tends to focus in on. Uh, sometimes maybe the thing you need to worry about is not as, uh, incapacitation but much more likely and also when you do worry about things that are incapacitating making sure you have the evidence to actually realize you know or to, to determine with best available evidence how likely is it to occur. Uh, so risk matrices in general have been used all over the place uh, engineer, engineering world to build highways uh, used to determine safety of releasing uh, sex offenders and all kinds of different things. Uh, but it was first used for air medical disposition by Dr. Gary Gray, as I mentioned before. Uh, when he, he works uh, on the International Space Station uh, Multilateral Space Medical Board, and he noticed that, uh, uh, as was mentioned in the talk yesterday morning, that the, in the space agencies they want numbers and they want stuff represented graphically, and they're using matrices, so 
Gary thought, well, why shouldn't we be using matrices for the, for the human component of, of the space missions? And so he came up with uh, one for uh, uh, the uh, Multilateral Space Medical Board, and then he came up with another set of uh, matrices for the RCAF around uh, 2006. And uh, we heard about the integrated matrix model from uh, Colonel Pat McGuinness, and, and uh, that's a great model, and I think that's really where the future is at. Uh, in terms of individual air medical disposition decisions, uh, that model, I mean, it takes uh, you know a week to run through thousands of, of different uh, uh, cycles to do your analysis, and it has a lot more capability in the future, but it's not something that's an iPhone app. You can just hit it and figure out, okay, how is this going to help me make a decision today? And the uh, uh, the MSMB is still using matrices to this day, and there are people up in space right now who've had decisions made util utilizing this tool, the one that created for the space agency. Uh, this is our pilot matrix. So uh, the lot of stuff here, but I just want to break it down. So on the y-axis, first of all, you have your probabilities. And you may notice that if you take the 1% rule, it kind of splits down the middle there. Very convenient. Uh, so one axis, you go from not very likely to more likely. And on this axis, going left to right, class 1 to 4, it's uh, consequences less bad to more bad. So pretty simple concept. It uh, teases things out. And then you have three colors. Very intuitive. Green is good. Red is bad, and yellow is in between. Uh, the in between means you may want to order more tests, get more information, uh, research a few more articles, help, make, uh, make, help you make your decision. Uh, and, and sometimes I'll lead to things. If, if someone's like a single uh, uh, seat pilot, we may look at uh, with or as co pilot uh, restriction in that case. Uh, when we're looking at the consequences, here we broke it down into impact on mission and, and obviously flight safety on, on the uh, far right, uh, the impact on the, the human, and the requirement to get down and get uh, rapid medical attention. So if you notice here, just the distribution, it's uh, got the reds here, greens down here. There's obviously the bad quadrant, the good quadrant. And uh, for, um, for pilots, as you saw before, if you're looking at dual pilot commercial type flights, you have, you know, the assumption is that uh, only one time out of 100 will that lead to a crash if pilots are incapacitated. There's a bunch of similar studies that say that really 399 times out of 400, uh, the co-pilot will save the day. And we have new systems. We have, you know, auto takeoff landing. There's a lot of other things that uh, challenge that assumption. So that, that's a big safety factor. So for us, if you look here, actually, we're kind of below the 1% threshold for uh, 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 fast air pilots single seat, injection fighters, that type of thing. Uh, whereas we kind of, I don't have the matrix for the uh, for strategic airlift, but basically if you go to, to dual pilot tactical, it'd be more like here where you're right on the 1% line, and then it would be uh, actually a 2% rule for a strategic uh, uh, dual pilot aircraft. And there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of literature out there recommending a 2% rule, saying that's a, it's a pretty safe update of the uh, the one percent rule so as I said this can be this tool can be modified depending on your operational context different types of uh, crew members or different types of missions so what we've done is we also separated out non-pilot air crew saying that the the colors you'll notice are different much more green less red and so these are you know the FEs the load masters that type of thing and then we also have a, a third one for the what we call Group B air crew, which is the uh, uh, the Ringo stars of air crew. The people are just happy to be there. So that's uh, I won't say who they are, but uh, we're not they're less likely to cause an accident. So the risk matrix is a great tool. We don't use it in every single case. Sometimes it's a slam dunk, and uh, you don't need to uh, pull that out. But certainly for the more difficult cases and more challenging cases, it's useful and the principles can be applied even without having the, the uh, matrix in front of you. Uh, so we'll do a quick case study, realizing I'm the last person now, so thank you for that. Um, the, uh, we have a 33-year-old pilot. This is actually the first uh, case that we use the, uh, the matrix in, so this is a bit of an older legacy case. Developed ascending paresthesia from the feet to the umbilical level over a three-week period. No bowel bladder, motor uh, bowel bladder, motor symptoms, 
and it gradually was resolved over uh, several weeks. Reviewed by the neurologists, bilateral limb, uh, lower limb hyperreflexia, slight alterations of vibration, light touch over toes only. Diagnosed was subacute transverse myelopathy. Uh, and they queried possible uh, initial presentation of MS. So the uh, pilot was referred to our institution where he had an MRI of the brain and spinal cord showing a focus of a probable demyelination at T67. Uh, the brain also showed uh, three unidentified bright objects, uh, but no evidence of any demyelination. And full up full assessment was normal, cog screen normal. So time of presentation, he was flying the T33, so you know it's an old case. Uh, I was grounded for six months, and uh, initially they, they struggled with this case and uh, assigned with her as co-pilot, pre-matrix. Uh, he was gonna be reassigned and trained up on, on Herx for search and rescue, and then they, uh, they reviewed the case further with the matrix and uh, had a very thorough literature review, aviation neurology consultation, and uh, he was deemed fit pilot and they retained him on the T33 and you can see in the matrix he falls in the blue for transverse myelitis based on the probability of uh, between uh, a half and, and one percent of a recurrence and the recurrence was deemed that it was going to be uh, it would not be a sudden incapacitating event it would be slow onset and that type of thing so that helped uh, helped guide the discussion and the decision making uh, over the next five years of uh, follow-up, he had uh, MRI and showed everything was stable, no evidence of demyelination elsewhere, ophthalm and cog screens remained uh, absolutely normal. So the, the risk matrix does have limitations as every tool does. Uh, it is, uh, when you look at the probability side, that's really limited by the best available evidence. The, the, the consequence side is you're really trying to give your best guess as to what you think the consequences will be given a particular medical event. So there is a qualitative uh, uh, element of that where you're, you're trying to decide which categories it fit in and, and uh, what, you know, how likely is it that you're gonna have that consequence. You do know that some things are more likely to be severe than others, which in this allows you to stratify that, but it's not purely quantitative. Uh, there, you cannot say for certain what the consequences will be, no one can, and uh, the categories may be non-linear. It all depends on the type of matrix. Uh, here, uh, the subjective part, it may not be that you can say, well, we have a four by four matrix, so therefore the severity consequence is zero to 25% of some scale for the class one and 25 to 50, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that can affect your, the, the ability to uh, come up with a composite risk index of, of, of multiplying the X and Y axis, that type of thing. Um, and, and there's no confidence intervals. Now you do, you absolutely need to, uh, when you do your lit review for the um, for the probability of the medical event, you need to pay attention to what is the level of evidence, what kind of studies you're getting, how many are they consistent, and that will help to uh, guide how much weight you put on that in your decision making, uh, but the, the tool itself doesn't give you any uh, types of confidence intervals. And you do need access, uh, to put this in practice on a regular basis, you need good access to, to uh, good quality uh, epidemiological information. Of course, that's getting easier and easier every day. There's a number of websites and things you can pay for that will uh, do the law literature review for you and give you incidence rates, that type of thing, and give you references in the bottom you can click on. Uh, so the better that gets, the, the, the more solid your, uh, your recommendations will be. So in conclusion, the 1% rule is a very useful risk management aid. However, you do need to consider uh, the underlying model assumptions and its limitations when you're applying it in the military aviation context. Both risk matrices and the 1% rule utilize the best available quantitative evidence to determine the probability that the medical event will occur. Unlike the 1% rule, risk matrices assist the practitioner when considering medical events less severe than, uh, than incapacitation across a spectrum of potential consequences. And as with all such tools, risk matrices provide an analytic framework which inform error medical disposition decisions and does not substitute for sound clinical judgment. And you can say that for pretty much everything. 
If it's in the yellow, you still have to figure out which way you're going to go. And even if you're in the red or green, you still need to look at, well, how, you know, how good was the level of evidence? And is there some other reason why we need to think harder? But you, it will force you to ask the right questions. So, back to the question. Explain to show some learning. That's okay. Right, that should be open hey. now. Still not open. And I say, when, one thing you can think about when you conceptualize this is you can put the 1% rule, if you want to stick with that, in the y axis and just think about this as teasing it out across consequence severity. So it's simply adding another dimension to the 1% rule. And then again, for the reasons I mentioned, you may want to consider whether that's a one size fits all rule. Great answer. Correct answer is B. Uh, both it will not make your decision for you, and it's not based purely on quantitative data. Thank you. Fantastic.